I'm going to tell you a bit about the real story about me now. Yeah, that, that was the sort of official uh, uh, story. And, and cause one of the things about me uh, that I think is one of the reasons why I ended up at the Sat Trust is that education really shaped my life. And um, when uh, I was 15, I was at my mum and dad split out. I was from London. I, I was li living on my own in a, in a flat in London. I dropped out of school. And um, it was actually a, a friend, and often the, 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 the tales of social mobility often involve, they're very personal stories we find with a lot of the children that we support, and it was actually my best friend who said that he was going back to retake his A-levels, and I basically sort of went along with him, and that then led to uh, university, uh, Sheffield University I went to, and, and that sort of tra transformed my life. So, um, so I guess I, I, would, I would argue that I am, I, I would have been a Sutton Trust kid in many ways if the Sutton Trust had been around uh, then. Um, so, so I think I'm going, to I'm going to talk a bit about the statistics around social mobility, but I think you, you, you know I think it's important to remember that there is a very personal uh, thing this, and a lot of the children that we now support, you listen to them, it's often a teacher or a family member or a friend that's actually influenced them. So, but I'll perhaps come back to that a bit later. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to also uh, say is that I'm, I, I, it's great to get out of London, right? So I don't, I don't get out of London uh, often, and, and I'm actually appearing twice in Yorkshire. I'm John Robson over there, who's, who's Pro Vice Chancellor here uh, at York, is also a Sutton Trust Fellow, and I, I, I met John uh, last week, and um, I was saying that um, I'm in a band, right? This is the uncoolest band probably in the universe, and it's a band of theoretical physicists, and. Uh, <laughs> We played at Sheffield 25 years ago as students, and we're, we're playing again at City Sheffield Hall uh, in a month's time, which is really exciting. The drummer is the head of physics at, at Sheffield, Professor Nigel Clark. <laughs> so, um, so that's, I, I promise you I won't, I won't be playing any musical instruments tonight, right? But, uh, but it's just gr great to be back anyway, and, and so I'll, I'm back in Yorkshire twice. Um, this is also, and I will get to the subject, don't worry, is, is a first for me to, to talk properly about social mobility in a, in a sort of public uh, way. So I think York, it's great that you've done it. I've already been asked by Warwick to do this. Already. So you, you're first here, so I think there might be a few more, uh, hopefully, after this. Who knows, Cambridge and Oxford might even ask me to come, come along. Um, so thank you very much for that. So I, um, I want to talk about this issue of social mobility. We hear a lot about it, and I'm going to... Um, give you some sort of um, some, some examples of some studies that we published and uh, that, that uh, I think have raised this issue really in the, in the sort of political public debate. And I want to prompt some questions and I hope we can have some debate after because so I do think there's some really interesting issues that I'm going to raise. I won't have all the answers either. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a bit about this, you know, why we think so much social mobility is low in this country, why we think that's a problem. Uh, and I'm going to try and define what I mean by social mobility as well, right? For this, a lot of academics in this audience, so I thought I'd better do that. And then what the Sutton Trust actually does about it. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you said, uh, our chairman, slight, slightly cheesy, calls us a do tank. And, and that, I think, gives us a lot of credibility in these debates. We're not just a sort of think tank. But again, I'll talk a bit about uh, what we do. So, I wanted to start off with this uh, metaphor, really, um, and I don't know if some of you might have seen this before in, in the literature, uh, and it's, it's really, this is a caravan going through the desert, I hope you can see that, and, and I just wanted to show this first because I wanted to define what, what I mean by social mobility, because often in the debates I have uh, on radio or, or in public debates, I find that people are meaning different things when, they, when they're talking about social mobility. So. Um, the sociologists tend to talk about absolute mobility, right? So that's how better uh, people are one generation compared to the, the previous generation. Uh, so John Goldthorpe, for example, will talk about absolute mobility and, and, the, and the rates and whether that has declined or not over generations. And if you like, uh, absolute mobility would be this current, would be whether they're sort of moving a bit faster. So a progress here would be rate of movement, right? So, so, so if this caravan was moving more quickly than the previous uh, generation, uh, then you'd see this, this movement. But what you wouldn't see necessarily is anyone actually changing position in that long, uh, winding caravan. Now, the economists that we uh, and others have commissioned to do work on mobility tend to think about it in terms of relative mobility uh, and tend to define it in income in in uh, rather than social class. And that's where you actually get movement within this caravan. So someone might start at the back, but then might go to the front, OK? And so that, that might happen through education or other ways. And I think just when we come to discussion, it'd be good for everyone to think about this caravan, because I think there are different policy issues and different questions that relate to both absolute and relative mobility. 
I think the Sutton Trust would probably want a world, uh, we will probably want many things, but we would probably want many, a world where there was greater absolute and relative mobility. But we can, we can come back to that. Um, so the other thing to think about, I think, and we'll, you know, is, is how you measure mobility. So is it in terms of income, social class, educational qualifications? There's always different ways of, uh, of measuring it, and they've all got their weaknesses, actually. Um, but I, and I think the other thing that you, you, you have to remember in these debates is, is that they, 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 don't, they don't represent absolutely everything. So I've got friends, many friends, who I would classify as downwardly mobile, but they're very happy, they're more happy than their parents in many ways, right? So, so as I've got a friend who, uh, his mother is an M was an MP and dad, uh, father was a really busy uh, doctor. Uh, he's a park ranger, he's living happily with his family, you know, so I think, I think you know, how we measure mobility, we have to be very careful what we're implying for, for life more generally. Again, we come back to that. The reason we use things like income is because that's what you know, data we can, we, can, we can get in terms of measuring these things. So these are averages that, that sort of imply things, but they don't, I think you have to be a bit careful in what they, what they mean you know, in, in, in real life terms. Um, and then lastly, I think you can also think of income inequality and wealth inequality, which I'm going to talk a little about with this caravan as well. So I guess you would have a shortened caravan if there was less income inequality. I was trying to think what wealth might mean. I, was, I think maybe a camel is wealth in this. So if you've got a camel, it gives you even greater returns in this, in this analogy. But that would maybe pushing the metaphor a bit far. But we, we can come back, back to that. So I think when we come to questions, I want you to tell me where, what, what, what sort of mobility you are uh, thinking about. So, uh, and then I just wanted to really clarify, I guess, and, and John prompted me to think about this last week, but is why, why we think greater mobility is a good thing. And uh, I think it's, it's important to sort of try and clarify why this is. So this is Paige Cunningham, uh, one of our beneficiaries. So the Sutton Trust has helped about 20,000 students on its uh, programmes over the last 18 years. And Paige is, I suppose, a typical uh, Sutton Trust student. Um, she was uh, living um, uh, with a single mum on free school meals in a state school. Uh, her father had, had, had left. Um, no one in her family had been to university before. Um, she went on our US programme. This is a programme where we take kids to the Ivy Leagues, basically. Not just the Ivy Leagues, but we have this, this American programme now. So we, a lot of our children end up in top universities in the, or highly selective universities in the UK, but there's also this, um, this incredible American program. Uh, Paige is enrolling at Yale University this year. So, um, so it's a kind of amazing story, and, and we've had lots of publicity about Paige and a hundred other kids that we've helped in this way. She's on a full scholarship at, at Yale. Her life has been transformed. And the interesting thing I think about Paige, I would say, is also it's not just her life has been transformed. It's probably her children's and their children's lives. So, you know, it's, it's a sort of almost like, we would perceive this as almost like an intergenerational switch in, in terms of opportunity. So, so that's, I think, why, so there's a sort of individual benefit. But I would argue there are other benefits as well. And again, we can discuss these perhaps at the end. But I think that, you know, we would argue that, it, that there's, it, a society is more healthy if we're trying to, f if we are able to fulfil the talents of all. Uh, the children. So it might not be quite as dramatic as Paige, but you know, the Trust does a lot of work in terms of, for example, getting poorer children to get basic maths and English when they leave school. In, that, in, a, in an absolute mobility terms, that's just is important in many ways. So I think, I think there's something about we should aspire to a society that fulfills talent wherever it, wherever it is. And that might be creative talent as well as academic. You know, we tend to focus on specific things, but I think we would, we would argue that, that, that talent is much wider than than, 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 than that. Um, there, there are studies that, that, that suggest that, um, that, that, that actually um, there are also improved economic health of the country. So if we, fulfill, if we did do more of that, if we did raise the educational uh, attainment of, of more of our children, then you do see uh, improved economic, um, there's an increase in gross domestic product, basically. Again, we can debate the causal mechanisms there, but I think there is some evidence that suggests that. So it's better for the economy. And lastly, particularly at the top end, we would argue that, um, that you know, the cabinet, for example, uh, should be more broadly representative of society at large. At the moment, two thirds of the cabinet uh, that, that, that oversee this country are privately educated. Private schools make up 7% of all schools. Now, I don't have anything personally against those that are privately educated, but I do think that, it, that in our world, the cabinet would be more broadly representative of, of society that they are intended to serve. Again, we can talk about that um, later. 
Uh, you know, the Prime Minister, we, 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 there's a stat that I use, it's a very carefully worded stat, so, so it's that every English Prime Minister since the war who has gone to university went to one university, and that was Oxford, right? So, um, so you know, we, we, it's quite a narrow uh, uh, elite that we have at the top. Increasingly, when we talk to businesses, the Sutton Trust, it's really interesting, some of our corporate sponsors, they are asking us uh, for more diverse talent as well. So they, there's, I think there's an increasing argument uh, in, in our corporates, and we talk to the BBC, we also talk to, so, so, you know, is, is around decision making should, is, is more healthy if you have a diverse group of people, and that might be uh, down to social class as well as gender and, and ethnicity. So again, very, uh, be, be very interesting on your views on that, but I would say those are the sort of things that we, we, we believe uh, why, why mobility is important. So this study, I just want to start with, um, is, is a quite a famous study that we published in 2005, and this was by a bunch of economists at the LSE. And this um, basically did two things. It, it showed, uh, or, or, or it suggested, that um, income mobility, actually, rather than social mobility. So the economists, again, using income rather than social class to measure mobility. And they looked at two cohorts um, that, that are very famous in, in academic circles. Uh, a, a cohort, national cohort born in 1970 and, and, and one born in 1958, and they basically compared the mobility rates for those two cohorts. So they looked at the income that, the, that people were in as children, and then they looked at the income bracket they were in as adults, um, and, and they monitored the 1970 cohort. Um, and they're still tracking this stuff. Um, and, and what they found was that, that um, that the mobility in their definition, that's relative mobility measuring in terms of income, had actually declined for the 1970 cohort compared to the 1958 cohort. Not only that, is that when they compared with data in other countries, and you can do this quite well with income data, that we and the US had the lowest mobility rates for every, any country, uh, developed country we, for which we had data for. Now that came as quite a shock at the time in 2005. So this was at the height, so Blair government had been in for about eight years. I don't know if you all remember it, but there was, a lot of there was a lot of positive talk about a new meritocratic world. And it's, it's really interesting, you know, a lot of people ask me why, you know, this trust has been quite successful in terms of publishing research studies that get a lot of um, uh, debate going. And I think this one, it was, it was pure luck. I think, I think we had, you know, this had, we really was, if you look at the, the actual paper, it's a review of evidence that had been around in academic circles for some, quite some time. Um, but I think it hit... The, 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 the media at a time when there was this sort of debate around meritocracy, uh, you know, whether the Blair government was fulfilling uh, their, their aspirations to have more equality of opportunity in society. So it, it was a real bombshell at the time. And, and this issue, this, this term social mobility, if you look at the records, you know, before 2005, it was a pretty academic uh, term actually, and it was discussed in, in, in academic circles. Post 2005, you've had incredible. Uh, public debate about this issue, um, and some people would argue too much, actually, but we'll come to that. Um, so this was the study that I suppose put social mobility on the map, and we're, we're very proud to have done that. Um, and, and it's and it's and it's uh, loads of academic scrutiny since then. What I've realised with academics is that if someone gets lots of profile through a study, you'll get loads of other academics trying to pull this study down. Right? There are, there have been so many studies that have. Uh, and I do think there are some limitations to this study, don't get me wrong. Um, now, I do get frustrated sometimes when people cite the social class literature to say that actually social mobility, if you look at Goldthorpe, you know, John Goldthorpe's the sort of doyen of social mobility studies, he's got a lot of time for. Um, he, he does classify in different ways, and he does get see, see different trends. So, he, so John Goldthorpe would say, in terms of social class, there hasn't been any decline, right? He, if you look at social class mobility in this country, but what John would say, actually, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. So if you look at John Goldthorpe's studies, you know, the uh, chances of a, of a, of a son um, uh, who's got a professional uh, father getting to be, become a, a professional when they grow up, it's about 20 times that of a son from a working class father. So, you know, the gaps you see in the Goldthorpe type mobility are huge. Uh, it's just that he would disagree that there's a decline. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that because I think there's some other things that suggest that, that there was this post-war blip, I would argue, uh, there, where there was an increase in mobility and, 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 a, and a reduction in income inequality. And we're, in a sense, we're moving back to where we were uh, before the war, but we, we can come to that. So that was the, the sort of study that put it on the map. 
This, this I, I guess, I, I was thinking hard about this. I was, I was wondering whether to call this the vortex of declining. I was trying to think of something really dramatic for you. Um, and I guess this summarises, in a way, the hypothesis below much of the Sutton Trust work. And, and it really is the combination of two things, and that's the widening income and wealth inequality gaps. That you're, and, of course, York, you know, here, the spirit level was born partly here, right? So, so you'll know all about this, the, the concerns about how widening income inequality affects society. I would add wealth inequality, and you've all probably have seen the debates with Piketty over the last year as well, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit. So, um, you know, wealth as well as income inequality is widening. I think what we would say from our perspective is that it's the interaction with the education system that we see as, a, 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 as, a, as, a, as a particularly problematic. So, um, so you see, and I'll, and I'll show you some, some data on this, that those at the, w w with these incredible amount of resources are devoting more and more resource to the educational outcomes of their children in various ways, who then are getting to become, uh, to, 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 to grab those elite education opportunities particularly, of which there are increasing returns. So if you look at the literature on, on returns to degrees, you know, if, if, if you look at the, I'm sure York is among them, but if you, if you look at the elite end, the returns are increasing to that elite end. Whereas um, for those kids who perhaps are in areas where there isn't much prospect for employment, you can see that they can see that the returns for them from their schooling is perhaps, it's almost a rational response to saying that, well, actually there isn't much return. So, so I think there's a widening returns to education. Of course, if those people that have had the resource get the best education, then they'll get the best returns in terms of earnings and other things, and then feed that back into their children, right? So there's this kind of feedback loop that we observe a lot, and that leads to this declining social. I think of the vortex, I think of our kids being trapped in this vortex and us trying to pull them out and, 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 and raise, raise their opportunities. So these are just some of the facts, I think, that underpin what I've just said. And I, I won't go through them all. Uh, I've, I've referenced Kate Picker because I th it's, it's, it's always, it's Kate hardly, I don't get, think, get as much recognition, recognition as she should do on, on some of the, um, on, on, on the famous book. Um, and, and it's nice because I've got Piketty and Pickett in, in the same slide here. <laughs> um, so you, you will have seen the, the spirit level stuff. I think it's obviously been incredibly uh, influential in the debate and sparked a lot of controversy about causality, and, and, and which, which we may, may, may come to. Um, and, and so the, the other thing I think I just wanted to mention was wealth inequality, and I certainly observe this in London where I live. Um, you know, I'm, I was a young journalist, as, as Beatrice alluded to earlier, my partner was a nurse, and we, we managed, you know, 15 years ago to buy a house that was run down and then do it up, and now, and now you know, so we just about managed to ride the way. Now, in our era of North London, honestly, you, the, the wealth that, that, that you see, and, and, and it would be impossible for us to buy a house where we now live. And now we're worried about our children because we don't know what, what you know, we'll probably have to move north, I think, to sort of, if our children are going to have, have housing. So I think, um, you know, you, 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 so that's an example, I guess, of what Piketty's saying, which is that, that, that and I guess you will have all seen this, that there is increasing wealth inequality, and the returns to that are bigger than the income returns you get from earnings. So, so you know, if you have a big house, and we see this in, in North London a lot, they, we know people that don't actually bother to work because they've got so much equity in their house, and they will, will devote a lot of that and they will, you know, to, to the outcomes of their children. So I think there's something interesting about wealth. The other thing about wealth and income, I think, is that if you look... Uh, at the trends, and again, I'll be interested in views on this here. Uh, my reading of the literature is that you, you did see this um, blip, if you like, post, well, post Second World War, post wars, where you did see this narrowing of, of, of you know, you saw more equal uh, wealth and income for so various reasons. I'm not suggesting we should have another war, by the way, is it? But, um, but that. And, and alongside another other thing, you do see this boom, and even John Goldthorpe would say you saw a boom in mobility post-war. So, you know, was there a sort of perfect storm of conditions that actually made, you know, uh, people uh, have better opportunities? And are we reverting back to the norm? That, that I think that's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, concept, is, is this sort of bl post-war blip and whether now we're returning. Um, there's, there's, listen, I could have chosen hundreds of stats from the studies that we've done over the years, and we're pretty relentless with this stuff, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we've looked at private tuition over the last 10 years, and, and you're seeing increasing uh, 
private tuition. You're seeing increasing private tuition of, of, kids, uh, of parents that send their kids to private school. You know, there is, I'm sure there's diminishing returns with some of this stuff. You know, I know people in North London who pay £75 an hour for the super tutors that are sort of trying, you know, for their children. Uh, but there's increasing money, I think, chucked at the, 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 the children, particularly at the, the high end. Um, Another, this was from the US, but I thought it was really interesting that the, the, the money spent on the enrichment gap, this is. Um, so the, 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 that, that, this is things like taking your children to the museum as well as you know, private tuition. It's a much broader definition. But you see these much bigger gaps in, term, in terms of, of that as well. So this is the sort of two sides to that, that spiral I was talking about. Just quickly, I just want to mention two other things. So I know I'm throwing a lot of things at you. It's called the Great Gatsby Curve, and I don't know, it's some, one of my good friends, Miles Korak, economic, Canadian economist, produced this. It was actually mentioned by Obama in one of his speeches um, a couple of years ago. And the thing that was important about this was that it was uh, implying, uh, and, it's, and, it, and it actually resonates a lot with the spirit level, I should say, um, on, this, on this area of income inequality, which is the... the um, the y-axis here, or sorry, the x-axis, and then you've got uh, social mobility, which is the y-axis. And what Miles Korak was doing was saying that there is a relationship between income inequality and social mobility. If you look at the UK and U US at the top, they have the highest income inequality and they have the lowest social mobility for, for the generation afterwards. Now, that might seem blindingly obvious to a lot of people in this room, but it was quite controversial because I'm sure, as you'll know, um, a lot of people challenge whether that is a causal link, right? So, um, you know, and I think we can just talk about this, this later. You know, there are, there are lots of, uh, so there's lots of perhaps people on the right side of politics have come back and said, well, actually, there's no causal link there. And you do need some income inequality to incentivise people to do well in society. So I'd be interested in your views on this. But I do think it was a powerful slide. Um, and it suggests, I would argue, there is some sort of causal link. This is another study. This was in the US. I just wanted to mention this as well because I think, it, again, I, I've seen many studies over the years that suggest similar things. And this was really interesting. Uh, it looked at social mobility in different areas of the US. I, th I, I worry sometimes about US-wide uh, summaries because it's such a huge country with so much diversity. And what it showed was that there was huge um, differences in social mobility rates in different states and different uh, towns and cities. Again, there's caveats to this research, but again, you got, you got this correlation with income. So areas where there was more income inequality had, lo had, had lower mobility. School quality, education was, was a huge issue. Uh, there's other things that I think are particularly uh, issues in the US, residential segregation. So again, I would, I would suggest, and again, perhaps for discussion, that these things are causally related, but this is correlational, right? But I, I think there's increasingly number of studies that show these, these sort of links. Now this is where I, I just wanted to sort of show you some of the uh, <coughs> studies that Sutton Trust has done over the years on who... Uh, and this is at the high end. I just, and this is just to give you a sense of who is getting those most influential jobs, okay, and, and the highly paid jobs. Most of them are in London. <laughs> um, but um, so, high court judges, any ideas of how many, how many of these would be privately educated? 90%. 90%. Actually, it's 70%. Um, uh, leading journalists, any? It's actually 45%, um, but I think it's getting higher. Uh, government advisors, now I didn't publish this one, I did this, uh, I, I went around and asked all the new government advisors, and, and uh, in the end I didn't get as many responses, but from my selective response, uh, 80%, I've, and I've, I've actually said that um, every government minister should, I believe, have at least one state educated advisor. I, 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 I really don't see any problem with doing that, but um, we'll see whether that happens if the new government comes in. Now, I put these on here because of the audience, right? Usually I do I have bankers and all these high-powered people. Not that, not that academics aren't high-powered, right? But, <laughs> and, and they're probably not quite as well-paid as some of these other people. But I just, we did do a study, and it was quite interesting. It was 42%. Those were academics who were Royal Society, British Academy fellows. So they were academics that had been chosen. So there was some debate about whether it was then the fact they'd been chosen to be these prestigious fellows that... that, that made them more privileged or not. But anyway, that, it, was, it was something we did. Vice chancellors, interestingly, were very proud that they're only 21% uh, privately educated. A lot of grammar school uh, products. Um, in, 
and MPs 35%. And, and, you know, and the thing that we always talk about is the fact that 7% of people are probably educated. Now, again, I, I stress that I'm, I, you know, I don't sort of, you know, I'm not angry at people who are privately educated. You know, I've got friends who are privately educated. But, but I think it, it, for us, it, it, all this, we would argue, represents a huge waste of talent, that there is 93% of schools that are state some of them are grammar, of course, but there's, there's you know, 89% that are non-selective state, and there is a lot of talented children in those schools. And that we would argue that um, even academics, perhaps, we, we should worry. I do actually worry about the, the, the future of academia, because I, I worry that because the pay, and increasingly I look at the bureaucracy in academia as well, you know, I do worry about how representative academe will be, actually, of, of, for future generations. But very interested in your views on, on that. Um, the other thing, and I mentioned this to, to, to Paul Wakeling in, in, in before I came in, and the problem you talked to an academic before, you realise that it's all been thought of before, because <laughs> I thought all this was kind of new stuff. But he said, oh, no, Lee, that's in the journal X. This, this has, all, has already been uh, sort of cited and, and thought about. And this is the other thing I would have observed over the last sort of 10 years of to being director of research and, and, and heading up the trust. I call it the education arms race, and it's, it's really, uh, I guess, what the Sutton Trust and others are doing is, is, is trying to improve educational opportunities to help those from poorer backgrounds. So, and you see some gains, and you, know, you sort of jump for joy when you see these things, that 12% of free school meals uh, pupils going level, level five above in English and maths, um, and increased on 10% in to, to 2030. So there's been this, this slight increase for kids doing very well at the end of primary school from on free school meals background. But then the problem is when you look at the data for those not on free school meals, they've actually increased at a higher rate. So even though you've improved education for those from poorer backgrounds, the actual gap has got bigger. And you see this, I've seen this, I've been in international conferences, I've seen it in every country, I've seen it at every level of education. And I guess the hope from a certain trust perspective is if we keep on doing the stuff on the left, eventually the gap will narrow. But I have to say, these are incredibly stark gaps, and it's almost like the middle classes are reasserting their, their uh, advantage every time that we do something. It's a sort of arms race. And there's lots of other examples I could give you. I, I've just uh, brought out three. So university ex expansion over the last you know, 30 years, I've just quoted the last 10 years, you have seen some really discernible gains in terms of the number of poorer uh, students in, in the university system as a whole, but if you look at the selective universities, and, and I think York will be in this stat, you know, uh, the, that gap is incredibly stark still. So that again, you open up an educational opportunity, and then it's almost like the middle classes say, okay, that's good, but we're going to go and uh, make sure that the real uh, elite education bit is, is still the preserve of the, of the middle classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then this one's really interesting. So you've seen the studies that show state school students, on average, will, will do better at the university uh, in terms of degree grades than their independent school counterparts on similar grades. It's, it's an average over the sector. It does vary by university. Um, and so, you know, and there's always, there's always different ways of reading that, uh, again, which we could discuss. So that's a really good thing, I would say. The problem is that we found in, this, in the research that the... Uh, the privately educated students almost reassert their advantage in the workplace. And we, know, we, we think this is down to networks, internships, I think postgraduate access, incre increasingly access. So, you know, you do one thing and, and then, and then, you, and then and you, so, so I think, you know, Sutton Trust, again, I think we are hoping, I'm hoping that eventually those gaps will, 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 will narrow and, and that, you, that you'll get diminishing returns. But at the moment, these are big challenges. Okay. So I'm just coming on to what we do now. I'm trying to what, what, how much time I'm taking. We're, we're nearly, nearly towards the end now. Um, and I won't go over all the programmes we do, but I, I, as I said at the beginning, it's really important that we do do stuff as well, I think, for us. And when we go to see government ministers, I think it gives us a credibility um, in terms of asking them to do stuff, um, if, if we have done stuff. So, uh, and, and um, I, I would say a few things about this. The thing... You know, that really you want to do is influence government. Government, no matter how much money we can raise, the government is always going to have most. It's really interesting. We did a joint um, conference with the Gates Foundation in Washington, and Gates are slightly bigger than us, right? They got, they got a, <laughs> and, um, and it was really interesting. We spoke to them, and they said they are in the game of trying to influence governments as well. So even with all that money from, from Bill and Melinda, they're, 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 
they're, they're into that. And so, um, so I think what, what we've done, um, and, and the second point is evidence is, is everything really. So, so the university summer schools that we're very famous for, um, that was really that came from that missing 3000 study. So we produced a, a bit of research that suggested that even with the A-level grades, if you were from a well, middle income as well as low income background, you were less likely to put yourself forward for a selective university. So that came as a bit of a shock actually to the, the, the time. And then on the back of that, we trialled a programme which basically for a week uh, introduces a bunch of kids who have got grades from poorer backgrounds to a, a, a selective university. We're not saying you have to go, we're just saying have a, go and see a few lecturers, see some other kids that are like you. And often these kids are, I should, I should say children, sorry, that's Sir Peter Lample, these American influenced kids. Um, children uh, meet other children or students that are like them, and often that's a really powerful thing. So there's a peer group effect in those summer schools. Um, anyway, so we trialled that, and then um, we went to the government, said this works, we evaluated it properly, uh, and then that was under David Blanket. Blanket, this is a long time ago now, there's eight education secretaries back, I think. Um, the then Labour government then expanded that to all universities, and there was an aim higher <laughs> programme. Um, and so we saw that as a really, really good um, uh, win for us. Not only did we have our own programme, but every university in the country then had. Now, subsequently, uh, the government has cut that aim higher programme, which is another story. But you know, we, 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 we had a win, I think, for about 10 years. And, then, and now I think where we would, we would be, again, advocating to the next government that they should introduce some proper um, outreach programme uh, across, the, across the university system. The evidence point has been really important to us as well in that, um, so when the pupil premium was announced for, so this is what we saw it as a really positive move at the, at the start of this parliament, so this was the extra money in schools for disadvantaged students. The sort of the but for us was how that money is spent is crucial and, um, and this led us to come up with the Bananarama principle. principle which I don't know if you remember this song, but I do this with teachers and they're so young they don't get it. They don't remember Banana Rama, but, but they, they had this song, it's not what you do, it's the way you do it. And we have this sort of mantra with teachers, it's not what you spend, it's the way you spend it. Uh, Huntington School near here, which I'm visiting tomorrow, is one of the schools that does this really well. They spend their money well, they, they do look at evidence, there, but they are in the minority of schools. So we produced uh, a toolkit and it's quite well known now in schools, it's got, it was called the Pupil Premium Toolkit and really what that did was summarise research in an accessible way and it's been used by about 70% of schools uh, now in the country. How they've used it is another, another thing we could discuss. Um, it cost me £12,000 to commission that so that was, that's quite a, that's quite, I'd say that's quite cost effective uh, piece of evidence. And I think um, thinking about my own background again to come to the personal stuff um, I think if, if you think of my role, it's always been hopefully understanding the research and evidence, but then communicating it in a way that will influence policy or practice. Uh, and that, that's kind of, I, I suppose, a theme in all this. Partnerships with universities, I think, is always going to be key for us. Um, and, and partly, I think that's, I hope that they would have the same values as us. And I'll come on to this in, in a second. I also think that hopefully they're going to be here for a long time. So, you know. Governments come and go, and, and you know, policies come and go, but I hope the Sutton Trust will be here for a long time, and I hope York University will be here for a long time. So I do think that in terms of this social mobility challenge, you do need a long-term uh, approach to this, okay? And of course, universities, I hope, would be interested in, in seeking talent from wherever it comes. So, so we, we have many partnerships. I think we've partnered with about 20 different universities, from Harvard to Cambridge to York. Um, in, in fact, we don't do as much York as we should do, but partly because you're very successful. So if you look at the, the proportion of state school kids at York, it's actually very healthy. Now, you're going to have to tell me how you're doing that. Maybe it's because there's a lot of state school kids in this vicinity. I don't know, but I'll be, I'll be interested to see what, what's happening there. <coughs> I think, by the way, what I was going to say, I do think it's a scandal that higher education access, we don't do more evaluation. So we spend around a billion pounds in the UK on, on uh, doing, uh, doing university access, whether it's outreach programmes, bursary support. I think we need to do more evaluations. Otherwise, uh, if we don't have evidence, another government will come, come and try and take that money away. So I think that's another thing we could discuss. Lastly, I, I just wanted to flag up some other things that we're doing. So for the first time, the Sutton Trust is interested in high-level apprenticeships. So a lot of the children we've been supporting are worried about uh, the increase in fees. And I think it's been really interesting. These, these, these are bright kids who are thinking for the first time, maybe 
if there was a high level apprenticeship, maybe that would be a more suitable route <coughs> for me. And we've got some data that's suggesting that for, for some uh, apprenticeships, they are actually be- better to do than m- many university degree courses. So I think uh, for the first time, we're going to have a programme where we, again, get schools to, to, to provide, if you like, the talent, but we, we will give kids a, an offer almost. We'll say, some of you can, can, can do the university access programme and some of you can maybe think about this apprenticeship route. be interested in your views on that. Housing, just to say, that I suppose this is a bit of research we're doing on the impact of housing in London on mobility. And, and I suppose it's the first time I can think of where we're verring on that other end. So, so when I showed you that spiral, you know, we tend to focus on educational inequality because I, I guess our, our view is that the income inequality debate is harder to, to, there's less traction there for us to get at. But I think increasingly we're so concerned about some of the, that, that, that we are now getting into that space a bit more. So I'll just finish on, on this as sort of our impacts. And there's various stats I was going to go on about, but I'm coming to the end now of the time. But I think I'll come back to this number eight here, the education secretaries that Sir Peter, my chairman, has seen over the last 18 years. And I, I think it's a really important point that... These problems are really big issues for society. And I, I guess yeah, we see policies come and go. As I said, we've seen governments come and go. I think it's really important that the trust and universities. And I think for universities, I think it's not good enough to say actually social mobility is the school's problem. You know, it's an attainment issue. I think universities should take a leadership issue on, on this. Again, be interested on your, your views on that. So I'm going to finish there. I'll come back to the caravan, right? So, because again, because I was going to remind you sort of, uh, to tell me what aspect of this you want to, to uh, talk about. But I guess the other thing I'll say is this is sort of represents the tough journey that we're all on for social mobility. But I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.